The Steam Deck is not the first time that Valve tried to usher in an era of gaming on Linux. And first time that they tried it, it didn't work, not even a little. I mean, getting devs to support a new operating system that worked in a completely different way than what they were used to and had a very, very small user base was an absolutely monumental task, and that's why it failed. But sometimes you have to fail in order to succeed later. I always like to, to say that failure is the first attempt in learning. And Valve learned a lot from their early failures, which is why we have what we have now. So fast forward a few years and Valve has actually succeeded at this. They didn't convince devs to adopt this operating system that very few people use, but what they did do is make it so that the devs didn't have to worry about it at all. And that's thanks to Proton. Valve is essentially doing what the devs wouldn't do. As a little bit of background, Proton is a compatibility layer distributed through Steam. It's downloaded and set up automatically when running any game that needs it. It's made up of a collection of different open source projects, including a heavily modified distribution of Wine. It is not an emulator, meaning that your game's executable code runs as is, without any modifications. However, when the app makes an API call that would normally go to an external Windows OS library, that call goes into Proton code instead. Now, if you don't follow this stuff super closely, you might not know what Proton is. Basically, Proton is a translation layer where Valve has figured out the most important Windows API calls since most games are made for Windows. And then every time a game says, hey, I wanna use this API to do whatever I have to do, Valve has the equivalent to the Linux version of that API call and it just puts that in instead, uh, which means that Valve doesn't need devs to actually make games for Linux. They could just continue to make their games for Windows and Valve can swap out the API calls on the fly and let us play Linux versions of the games that were never made with Linux in mind. We've got Windows games and they are now running on Linux. That absolutely is success and it is amazing that Valve was able to make it work because it was not an easy task and Valve had a lot of work cut out for them. They wanted the devs to do it themselves and support Linux, but the devs said no and so Valve said fine, I'll do it myself. But just getting games to run on Linux, that's just step one. Happy Surprise. birthday! Who? Oh, geez, what are you guys doing to me? What? Birthday? Wait a of second, it's, it's not my birthday. birthday. What do you mean right? it's not your birthday? It's today. It's my birthday. Isn't it? Today's your birthday. Wait, wait, you don't know when my birthday is? You guys do realize you're just copies of me. I edit you into existence. Wait, Whoa, I don't like where you're going here. Clones what, what are people mean? too. Like, I exist. You guys are both copies of me. Do we exist? What do you mean? I exist. No. Do you exist? Listen, I'll copy? prove it to you. I'm just going to edit one of you, you out of existence right now. I was a. Oh, where the heck did he go? What did you do with him? Listen, man, it's okay. We'll bring him back. I need somebody to make the thumbnail for this video anyway. Whether you're talking about birthdays, anniversaries, or Christmas, Bespoke Post is the perfect gift. It's a membership club that delivers a box of awesome from under the radar brands every single month. Plus, it's free to join and you even have the option to skip a month or cancel at any time. 90% of the products come from small brands, many of which are based right here in the US. Every month, they introduce their members to cool new products like outdoor gear, kitchen goods, clothing, and more based on what each member prefers. You just fill out a preference quiz and they send a box of awesome your way with about $70 worth of goods inside, but it only costs you a fraction of that price. What's even better is you get to preview the box that they've made for you before they send it out. Then you can decide if you wanna keep it, switch to a different box, or hold off for that month. They sent me the Weekender box, which has this ridiculously nice canvas bag in it. The bag's made out of canvas, leather, and metal, and this thing is high quality. They also sent me the Concentrate set, which has this cold brew coffee maker, 
a bottle of bitters, and this really nice concrete desk set. It's the perfect way to get ready and refreshed in the morning. So if you have somebody in mind that needs a present or a pick-me-up, or if you just want to treat yourself, head on over to bespokepost.com slash nerdnest20, or you can just click on the link in the description down below and use code nerdnest20 at checkout to get 20% off your first box of awesome. The thing about the Steam Deck that is really important is that it is fairly limited hardware. When it came out um, two years ago at this point, I feel like it's been two years. When it when it came out, it was already limited hardware. It's, you know, as much as I love it, is not the most powerful piece of gear that I have. Now, of course, there are some devs that have seen the light. You know, they looked at what was happening with the Nintendo Switch and handheld gaming and how popular it was. And they thought, all right, well, I'm making PC games. And then Valve releases the Steam Deck and they're like, wait a second, I can target those same users that love the Nintendo Switch, but I don't have to port my games over to the Switch. I can just release them on PC, do a few tweaks if you know their engine supports it and get my game running in a handheld form factor, sign me up. We didn't have to do anything, no optimizations, nothing special. We didn't have to degrade anything. It just ran and it ran well and it looked good and it looked like it was intended to look. And so when you think about that, uh, with so little development effort, that is quite a feat. I mean, like, so now for the first time, you actually can have your PC game play on a portable device the way that it's supposed to be played. And that without actually, to be honest, doing anything. And that's for development, that's actually pretty cool. Now that was the head of Larian Studios. I think his name is Sven Wiki. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. And he was saying all of that stuff before the Steam Deck actually came out. Like he had a pre-release unit, he was trying it out and he was saying, wow, this is really, really good. And Valve has only improved upon Proton and you know the Steam Deck itself since that video was recorded. In fact, we recently got this tweet about Lords of the Fallen. It says, shockingly, it seems that Lords of the Fallen has been specifically optimized for the Steam Deck. The game has its own unique control scheme for the platform, actually outputs at 800p, and seems to be perfectly playable at 30 frames per second with good image quality. Now, when you say perfectly playable at 30 frames per second, some gamers will bristle at that. Some people will fight back against that and they'll say, well, I don't want to play a game at 30 frames per second. And yeah, it does depend on what kind of your game you're playing. And apparently Lords of the Fallen is like a Dark Souls like game. So those typically are the types of games where you really want to have the most frames per second as possible. But you know, even I think like the most popular one I think was Bloodborne. I could be wrong about that. It's really not my genre. Uh, that one ran at 30 frames per second on PlayStation. And nobody, uh, I'm going to say nobody complained and everybody's going to tell me how much they complained. I didn't hear nearly as much complaining about that as I did about something like Redfall. Then there's games like Cyberpunk 2077. When the Steam Deck first came out and CD Projekt Red updated Cyberpunk 2077 with a Steam Deck specific profile, a lot of people were really excited about that and a lot of people, myself included, were really let down when we actually tried it. Because, I mean, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna say anything bad about anybody, but I feel like whoever greenlit that Steam Deck profile didn't try it at all because it was really, really framey. It was, I think I was getting like somewhere between nine and 15 frames per second. And that wasn't even in like busy scenes. Of course, with the Steam Deck, because it's a PC, you can, you know, update you know and change things as much as you want. So there were definitely guides out there on how to get the best performance out of it. Uh, but that was depending on the community to fix that. Now, if you fast forward to Cyberpunk 2077 2.0, which came out right before Phantom Liberty, um, the Steam Deck profile is much, much better. And if you don't wanna know anything about how your game is running, you can buy that game, turn it on on your Steam Deck, select this Steam Deck profile if it's not selected by default, and you're gonna be just fine. 
you can eke a few more frames per second out of it if you go into the settings and i've linked a guide down below if anybody wants to do that but this is you know another example of devs doing what valve wants them to do which is awesome and cd project red which is like this big company they're not the only ones that do it we even have some indie devs that definitely try and make the steam deck perform as best as it can here's a post from the folks behind hypercharge unboxed which is a really really cool first person shooter they say we're very proud to announce that hypercharge is launching on steam deck valve was kind enough to send us over a dev kit and we'd like to thank them again for considering us so what does this mean for you well it runs at 60 frames per second with an option to run at 30 frames per second in battery saver mode the graphic settings are automatically set for the steam deck and will be lowered automatically in the battery saver mode as well it has full controller support it has full gyro support you do not have to have that configuration in order to run the game on your steam deck meaning you can change it for yourself if you want and even when you dock it you will have split screen so this is all a bunch of things that this particular dev was doing and then valve didn't have to but sometimes it just isn't in the budget especially for these indie devs to cater to such a niche audience and i know that people who are watching this video are all fans of handheld pc gaming like you wouldn't be watching this video if you weren't but i'm here to tell you we are in a very, very small minority when it comes to the overall gaming landscape. And that's just something that people tend to forget is that not everybody is interested in the same things that they are. So it doesn't always make sense for smaller devs to support this, you know, like this niche audience that I'm talking about. But here's the thing is it does. And this is something that uh, I think that we saw in an interview over at Rock Paper Shotgun with Lawrence Yang and Pierre Lugrify. Now uh, here's what they said. There are benefits to game developers doing this work. If high end current gen titles are able to scale to the deck and be a great experience, it also enables smoother performance on a wider variety of PCs and improves the experience for the whole player base. And this is a really important point, as most people are not ray tracing their way through Night City in Cyberpunk 2077 on the brand new 4090s. No, in fact, in recent Steam hardware, we found that the most common card out there right now is a 3060, followed by the 1650 just nipping at its heels right now. Those are not the most powerful cards right now. And if you can make your game run well on a Steam Deck, then people who are running those 3060s or 1650s, they're gonna be very happy with the results that they're getting as well. But even though there are obvious benefits to making sure that your game runs well on PC hardware like the Steam Deck, there are devs out there that just don't have the resources from the publisher in order to make this happen. And that is where Valve tends to step in over and over and over. So I've got a few examples here of when Valve has stepped in and basically rescued a game in order to get it running on the Steam Deck. And sometimes that even had that um, lead on benefit of helping low spec gamers be able to run these games as well. Let's start off with this tweet from Pierre Lugrify. He said, the graphics team has been hard at work optimizing Elden Ring for the Steam Deck. Fixes for heavy stutters during the background streaming of assets will be available in a Proton release next week, but are unavailable to test now on the Bleeding Edge branch of Experimental. Now, I think it's important that we point out that Elden Ring was released on February 25th, 2022, and this tweet came out like less than 24 hours later, I think, it, yeah, February 26th, it came out the next day, which means Valve was able to look at that game and make those fixes and get that turned around and updated in Proton Experimental incredibly fast. <laughs> Now, 
sometimes a game is working just fine and a dev goes through and patches it and then it stops working on the Steam Deck. And Valve has fixed a lot of patches that were not their fault and they had no responsibility to fix, but they were able to fix them. And here's a perfect example uh, from Liam over at Gaming on Linux. He says, having trouble with the latest major update that for Halo Infinite on Steam Deck or Linux desktop, Valve has already released a Proton Hotfix update to sort it. The fix is available in Proton Hotfix, which is a completely separate version of Proton compared with the default 7 or even Proton Experimental. So if you have it set to Proton Experimental re already, you need to unset it so it will pick up the Proton Hotfix on Steam Deck. Then we've got another example from Pierre Lou, where they had a Proton hotfix that was pushed to fix Dead Space's map issue. It also addressed minor performance issues where the game's usage of variable rate shading was being ignored. The update was automatically queued within a few hours immediately upon Steam restart. Proton hotfix is automatically selected for Dead Space, so this requires no user intervention, which is awesome that the end user doesn't have to know anything. All you have to do is restart, which is that's the first thing that you say when you're trying to figure out how to fix something on a PC. Did you turn it off and on again? If you turn off Steam and turn it on again, you're going to automatically switch that game over to Proton Hotfix and you might not even know that it's been fixed. In fact, I don't know how many times Valve has done this without somebody noticing. And just to make sure that you know that the Plague Man is not slipping, that tweet came out less than one day after Dead Space came out. Like they are fast with this stuff. And then in March, Valve put out SteamOS 3.4.6 in the preview channel, which fixes invalid rendering and performance issues for Wol Wolong Fallen Dynasty and this is crazy to me, ray tracing for Doom Eternal on the Steam Deck. I mean, just this month, Valve updated, well, okay, they probably did a bunch of stuff, but one of the things that they did is they updated Proton in order to fix an issue that was happening with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2. And then most recently, they dropped a Proton 8.0.4, is it, or Dash 4? 8.0 Dash 4, which, had a whole bunch of fixes for a whole bunch of games, and I'm definitely not gonna go through the entire list. But the sheer number of games that get released on Steam every single day means that Valve cannot possibly continue to do this for every game. It's just impossible for them to do. So what Valve ends up doing is really focusing on the more popular games, the ones that people are really clamoring for, and that kind of leaves behind the smaller devs, the, don't have the resources. I mean, if you're to think about it, really the smaller devs are the ones that need this help the most, but the smaller devs are also the ones that have a tendency to try and support the Steam Deck out of the box anyway. Let's think about why they would do that. If they do, then they end up on their great on deck page in the store and a whole bunch of people are gonna start paying attention to that. Big games from giant publishers, they don't need that attention nearly as much because everybody already knows about those huge games. This does leave those smaller teams, the teams that have the fewest resources to fend for themselves. Sure, Valve can step in and fix Monster Hunter and Dead Space, but those games are made by big companies and they should find it in their budgets to cater to those lower spec systems, not just the Steam Deck, but a bunch of lower spec systems. But there are some optimizations that can be done automatically where Valve doesn't have to lift a finger because they've done all the work ahead of time. For example, the shader caches. If you don't know what shader caches are, a very low level explanation is that there's a thing that your game has to do. And when it has to do that thing, it has to run a little program and finish the calculations and then output that information to your game so that you have new information. When this is happening, often you'll see little micro stutters when you're playing a game, but then they go away. Like you go into a room and there's some bunch of micro stutters as the shader caches are happening and then, or the shaders are being compiled, I'm sorry. And then it all stops and everything runs smooth again. That's an example of shaders being compiled when you're playing a game. 
Valve has a solution to this. We have developed a robust shader pre-caching system as part of Steam. It lets all the needed permutations be processed before the game starts. This system is currently being improved for the deck, so that the processing is done on our servers ahead of time, as opposed to the user's machine. So essentially what's happening here is Valve is going through and compiling all of these shaders on their servers and then having you download that information to your Steam Deck so that when it comes time to run that particular shader, your Steam Deck doesn't have to do it. It already has the answers that it needs. However, there are a lot of times where it's not simply a shader cache that needs to be downloaded. And that's where Valve has to step in and figure out what exactly is the problem. Not necessarily performance problems, but like a black screen that's popping up that can't be fixed. And the devs have already made this game and moved on with their lives. They're probably not going to come back and fix it for, as I said before, this small niche audience. So Valve has to step in and fix it for us. Another thing that can be a huge help is for our team to be able to test and debug the game pre-release. As part of the Deck Verified pro program, we'll be offering tools to submit your build for pre-release testing. Such testing often allows us to uncover low-hanging fruit in time for release. A lot of times we're talking about games that were made before the Steam Deck was even a thing. And because of that, Valve has to be the ones to step in. They're going to continue to do so for the long haul. I mean, they sold this device to people and a lot of people think of it like it's a console, even though it's technically not a console, but it's a very console-like experience. I think that many people who own a Steam Deck, obviously not anybody who's watching this video, but many people would be surprised to find out that it's not a console. I think even more of them would be surprised to find out that the system is just playing Windows games and that it uses Proton to make that happen. Simply put, the people like you, and like me, that pay very, very close attention to this stuff, we are few and far between, which is why it is so important that games just work when it comes to the Steam Deck. Let's imagine for a second that you've got somebody who's a traditional console player and they see an ad on YouTube or they see, you know, they've been hearing about this Steam Deck a lot and they decide, you know what? I'm gonna buy one for myself. It's only $320 when you're looking at like a, a used version. Let's pick that up and see if it, you know, is awesome. Imagine for a second that you've got a traditional console gamer who they, they don't play PC games like ever, but they keep hearing about the Steam Deck. I mean, even if the Steam Deck is a niche device, it is constantly being talked about in the video game space. And everybody pretty much knows what it is. But to most people, when you look at it, it's just a handheld console from this company that you may have heard of before. So they make the decision to pick up one of these things and they start buying games from the Steam store, probably starting with the games that are labeled as great on deck. And for the most part, the games just work. Eventually they buy a game that doesn't launch right away and they would be probably pretty confused, pretty irritated because this is not something that you really run into in the console gaming world. So it is absolutely on Valve to make sure that these games are working, especially because many games were made before the Steam Deck even existed. And those games are all still available and mostly they run really, really well on the Steam Deck, but there are issues that people might run into. I've seen some people wonder, or worry about whether or not Valve is going to stick with Proton. Like what if Valve decides that they don't wanna do this anymore or perhaps Gabe retires and this is his baby. And so Valve says, all right, let's wash our hands of Proton and start shipping Windows on the Steam Deck. Now, I don't think that that's ever something that you'll have to worry about because they are super transparent about it. And just about everything that they're doing with Proton is open source. It's based on Wine and other open source tools like it. I mean, third parties could just pick up where they left off. Plus, Valve has already done most of the heavy lifting. I mean, most games, when you go to play them on the Steam Deck or on SteamOS, they just work. And that's because Valve has gone through, they've gotten most of the Windows API calls, they've got their translated versions for Linux. You go to launch that Windows game and it launches your Linux commands and you're all set off to the races, you get to play your game. So essentially they are now in the bug fixing stage and we have people like Code Weavers and folks like Glorious Eggroll to continue Valve's work if 
for some crazy reason, Valve decides that they don't want to work on Proton anymore. But I don't think that's ever something that you're going to have to worry about. If for no other reason, because Valve needs to push Linux as a gaming platform because of the Windows Store. If Windows continues to be the default gaming operating system, then there's going to be a bunch of gamers that their first click is on the Windows Store. And I know most people don't do that, but when I sit down at my Mac and I want to find a program to do something on my Mac, I said program like an old schooler, an app. Like I go to the app store and when probably novices who are mostly console gamers sit down at their computer, they might go to the Windows store looking for the games that they want to play, especially because that's where you go to download Game Pass. Now, you do not have to tell me that the Windows store is terrible and it absolutely is, but Valve can't sit there and hope that Microsoft continues to be bad at making the Windows store. I mean, eventually, maybe Microsoft will get the Windows store right. And then people are going to be like, well, I do I need to go into Steam in order to get this game? Or can I just buy it from this built in store? And that's something that Valve has to think about when they are making decisions about Proton. In fact, I'm sure that that's what drove them to make that Proton in the first place. But so long as devs continue to make games for Windows first and everything else, second, Valve is going to have to keep up with Proton and making sure that they make these games that run on Windows run on Linux as well. And I think whether they want to or not, Valve will continue to do what devs don't. Stay rad, everybody.